As I begin, I just need to take care of a couple of housekeeping things, so please stay with me and forgive me, okay? Can I get a well? Can I get a come on, pastor? Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, it's good to have you back in the house. <laughs> Love you, brother. We have the wonderful opportunity of celebrating a dear brother and sister a couple that I love very dearly, and I know the entire church family does as well. But both my brother and sister would think it wrong if we did not first give our attention to God Himself and the calling that He's placed on your life, which is no different, amen? No different than the calling that He has placed on every single believer's life in the sanctuary this morning. With that in mind, I'm going to turn to a very familiar portion of Scripture. Believe it or not, I have cut out three quarters of my sermon this morning in order for it to fit in the time frame we have. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Oh, come on, Pastor. What can you say about this text that has not already been preached a million times? Here's my answer. Not a blessed thing. And that is just fine. We're going to answer the very briefly, with broad brush strokes this morning. Hence, so much of the sermon now gone. We're going to answer some fundamental questions. You might recognize them. Who? What? When? Where? How? Why? There's your outline. Let's listen closely. What might the Spirit of Christ have to say through the Word of Christ to the body of Christ gathered this very morning. Let's listen. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in all the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Who? Well, we have three answers to that question in this text, and we're not going to take a great deal of time in answering this question, but we have three who's. First two, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. To whom? Yeah, Jesus is the one who is coming and saying these words. He's making the proclamation. The Father has given to me. Not some, not part, all of it. Even in 2021, do you believe it or no? All authority, all authority has been given to me. You thought 2020 was a rough year? Jesus didn't go anywhere. He's still the sovereign Lord. You worried about what we've seen in Indianapolis, in Chicago, 
many other places? You worried about Minneapolis lighting up this week? So am I. And I'm praying diligently and working with people as much as I can, brothers in particular in Christ in those areas, to help encourage, pray with, and guide some thought. But regardless, all authority rests in our Savior. Remember that this week. It is important for us to remember this in the church, not just because of the external circumstances of our society and culture. It's important for us to remember this in the life of the church, church ministry. All authority is given to Jesus. Any authority that anybody has is simply derived from the Lord Jesus. Nobody runs the church save Jesus. All authority has been given to me. Yes, you study. Yes, you develop skill. Yes, you work on persuasive kinds of arguments in order to lead people, remove intellectual objections, in order that you can point people to Jesus. But that is the point of both apologetics and evangelism. It is simply to get people to the point where they can clearly see Jesus. What are you going to do with Him? Because I don't have authority to do anything with you. There is one who does, and He is the one who will judge both the living and the dead. And his name is Jesus. All authority has been given to me. Yeah, but I'm, you see, I'm scared and timid of sharing my faith in Christ. Why? Even your testimony is a lot less about you than what you think it is. The best testimony is little on us and a lot about Christ. Amen or no? Why? Because who authorized the salvation? You didn't. Neither did I. Jesus did. All authority is given to Him, not me, not you. There should be a boldness in speaking on behalf of the name of Jesus Christ when you're able to say, I'm just here telling you on behalf of the King. I'm coming in His authority. Yeah, but you're a jerk. Granted. Right? Granted. I can be the biggest jerk in the world, but you don't have to answer to me. But one day you will answer to the one who has all authority that's been given to Him. So this great commission, this shared calling has been authorized by none less than Jesus the Christ Himself. Who? The authority of Jesus. Who? We. (laughs) Since all Authority, all authority is in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Jesus gives this command. Having gone, assuming that that's already in process, having gone, here's the command. Make disciples. Who? Yeah. Jesus is saying, you now. You make disciples of me. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And with that authority, I am commissioning you, I am commanding you, my people, my people who have been called by my name, my people, 
the ones for whom I lived a sinless life so that my record of righteousness could become your record of righteousness so the Father would see you in my perfection. You, you, the ones for whom I hung on a cross and shed my blood for the forgiveness and remission of your sins. You, you, the ones who have great wondrous hope because of my resurrection on the third day, and as I live, so shall you live. You make disciples. You whom I've created. You whom I sustain. You who I have made new creations through my life, death, and resurrection. You make disciples of me. Why wouldn't you? Right? That use collective, every single one of us. People who are uniquely gifted and called to go to Africa. Yep. Church planting, Chicago area. Yep. Back to Africa. Yep. Ministering in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yep. What about a person who works in Wedgwood would trouble you. I would think so. What about a person who comes into contact with people at an eye doctor's office? Yeah. What about people who choose to use their home in part as an Airbnb? with the idea of ministry opportunity. Yes. Electrician? Yeah. You get the idea, right? We could go all the way around the room. Who? Every single disciple of Jesus Christ is supposed to be making more disciples. That is primary calling. Since all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, I'm making this command that you make disciples. So the authority of Jesus, the first who, Disciples of Jesus, those who have been redeemed through His shed blood and made new creations, the second who. But there's a third. Of whom are we supposed to be making disciples? Right? Having gone, therefore, make disciples of... Wow. Uh... You know, the whole, the whole world. I don't know what to do with that. More later. So at least we have a basic, we have a pretty good understanding of the first who, the second who, and we know what the command is with the third who, make disciples of all nations. But I think we have to answer a couple more questions in order to put some of that into perspective. So let's talk about what. Again, make disciples. And making disciples assumes that we have pointed them to the one who has all authority. And that they embrace the one who has all authority. And then we make disciples as we baptize them in all the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them all things, teach them to observe, to practice, to participate in all things that Jesus Himself has commanded us. 
Okay, that's the what. So it's interesting again. We are not told make converts. We are not told simply, here's what you need to do. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make sure that a person prays a certain set of words in order to ensure that they are eternally secure. We don't read that here or anywhere else. See, the gospel has never been primarily about the right wording of a prayer. It has always been centrally about the person and work of Jesus. The person and work of Jesus. So what? We make a disciple. What is this creature that we call disciple? And it seems to me the question, what is a disciple, really finds its answer through answering another question, namely, what is the gospel? Because if the gospel is to produce disciples, then there's something in the content of the gospel that helps us understand what this person is to be at the end of this gospel. What does a disciple look like? What does a disciple walk like? Where does a disciple go? What does a disciple think? How does a disciple respond? What does a disciple smell like? What does a disciple wear? What shows does a disciple watch? What music does a disciple listen to? What is a disciple? Do you understand why I cut three quarters of the sermon out? That's a whole series, right? But there's something we do come to some conclusions about with regard to the gospel. There's the gospel about Jesus Christ. The gospel about Jesus Christ, which is very important. It's the content of his life, death, and resurrection. We come to the gospel accounts, the very word of God, as inspired word of God and historical document, and we read about the life and teachings of Jesus, and we are brought into contact with a person that blows us away. He is the very Son of God, God Himself, who has taken on the fullness of humanity so that in solidarity He would would sense and feel and participate in our sufferings. Take upon Himself, the one who knew no sin, take upon Himself our sin, our sins, our sinfulness, so that we could be forgiven. There's the gospel about Jesus Christ living a perfect sinless life. There's the gospel about Jesus Christ, His life, perfection, His teachings, remarkable. The perfection of His questioning of other people. The beauty of His storytelling, where He would take the audience and draw them in in the way even multiple times he would take the Pharisees and draw them in just when they thought they understood the point, the line at the end would hammer it home and the Pharisees would see themselves. They were fascinated by Jesus, so much so that they wanted to kill him. You know why? Because Jesus has a way of taking personal kingdoms and powers away. Remember, all authority is His. He knows it. There's a gospel about Jesus. 
where we come to know about Him and what He has done. And then there's the gospel of Jesus Christ, where in His teaching and in His life, He called us to a life that was consistent with what God's good intention was with creation. He called us to a life that would not continue to participate in the brokenness and sinfulness of the fall in human rebellion. He did not, in the gospel, He did not call us to invite Him into our lives. He called each one of us to participate in His life. Completely different thing. He called us to participate in His life, be freed from the bondage of sin. He called us to participate in His life for His glory, a people who believe in and embrace the truth of God's Word. That's a disciple. That's a different kind of creature. Somebody who embraces Jesus as Savior and Lord, boss, master. They believe in and embrace the truth of God's Word because they know God Himself has been faithful. And nowhere have we seen that more pronounced than in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as we can believe and trust fully in Him, so we believe and embrace the truth of the living Word, Jesus the Christ, and written Word, Holy Scripture. And then we surrender and submit to the reign of God in all areas of our lives while finding our chief joy and love in the triune God because of the person and work of Jesus the Christ applied by the Spirit. This is what a disciple looks like. This is what a disciple acts like. This is what governs a disciple's thoughts. This is what governs a disciple's affections. This is what governs a disciple's volition, their choices. The church then is a community of disciples. More than mere followers of Jesus. Certainly more than just being fans of Jesus. The church is a community of persons, a community of disciples who are surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and as disciples are more greatly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ today than what they were at our gathering last week. They're growing in their likeness of the one who is the head of the church. They're growing in their likeness in accordance to the character of the one who has redeemed them, namely Jesus the Christ. So the church then is a community of disciples equally called and equally sent to represent God's reign as Christ's disciples. In what ways? Here are a few. They are those who represent God's reign as a distinctive community of redeemed people. They actually are concerned about holiness. See, disciples all over the world Disciples are a holy nation among all the nations. They're a royal house of priests. In this royal house of priests, these priests take God to the people and bring the people to God. These disciples, the church, are a holy nation among all nations, a royal house of priests, a people for God's possession. These disciples, the church, 
They're faithfully obedient servants who visibly demonstrate God's mission for the world through our acts of service and meeting real needs for the world. These disciples of Jesus, the church, they are those who have embraced and are excited to be the messengers of the good news of God's story, finding its central expression in the person and work of Jesus the Christ. We are equally called and equally sent. As disciples, to do this work of the ministry to make disciples. Who, what, when? Well, now. until the end of the age, right? That's what the text is saying in the Great Commission. All authority is mine. I'm, my presence is going to be with you. Don't fear. Jesus is in the house. Always has been, hasn't left us. And my presence will be with you, my disciples, my people, my church. It will be with you to the end of the age. And you have this responsibility until I return. When? Now until the end of the age. Yeah, but when? Sunday mornings from 9.30 to noon. Yes. No. This is an important part of growing as disciples. But when? Moment by moment. Discipleship is not just a Sunday morning thing. When is connected with how. And honestly, brothers and sisters, I get this. I do. Making disciples in this day and age in America is a bit different than some of what it has been in the past. Don't get me wrong. The content remains the same. Jesus, the teachings, the doctrine, the life, the love. The content remains the same. The styles and methods will change. And the things that we face and the hostilities with which we face those things have changed significantly and will continue to speed up. Here's the problem for many of us. We have a ten tendency to like discipleship to be frozen in the time period and culture and method with which we have the greatest familiarity. And we have a great tendency to like discipleship to be frozen in the time period, culture, and method. The time period and culture and method that existed when we experienced regeneration or our greatest spiritual growth. And I get it. I get it. But by God's grace, may we learn to delight far more greatly in God, our risen Lord, the Spirit, and God's revealed Word and will rather than particular time periods, rather than particular culture, rather than particular methods that carry more sentimental value than truth content. God used them as vehicles for truth. And we've got to understand the distinction between vehicles for truth and truth itself. What is he using today as vehicles for the truth of the gospel in order that true disciples might be made and equipped? At least one thing has never, ever changed. Or two. One, the Spirit centrally works through His Word. Two, God uses His people. Who, what, when, 
where. Where, this is where we come back to where I left off at the beginning because I just didn't want to deal with it. Where, we're told the whole world, go. Go to all people everywhere in order to make disciples of all nations everywhere. Any amens in the house? Any people along with me who say, okay, but I can't do that? Yeah. Then, brothers and sisters, we must become more purposed in our going. This is something that both Phil and Kitty understand quite well. First, we are to make disciples by first being a disciple in the church of Jesus Christ. We are to make disciples by first being a good disciple of Jesus Christ and a faithful servant in Christ's church. Well, I want to be used over... Why do you sense God wants to use you somewhere else when you are not willing to be used by God in your local church? See, the missions team, part of their responsibility is to observe ministers in the church of Jesus Christ and to see their gifts, talents, abilities, observe how they are serving in the church so that they can say, we need to have a talk with, we need to help disciple, we need to help grow, we need to ask some questions of this person if they have ever thought about the possibility of being used of God over there based on their ministry right here. Is everybody in the house with me? That is an important part of what your missions team is called to do. First, we're to make disciples by being one. Then we go where God has placed us by looking looking around us through eyes that frame our entire existence with God's glorious true story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation. What was God's good intention with creation here? What is broken as a result of sin? What is God's redemptive work? How does that move into this right here? And how can we be used of God to more deeply make disciples in this place? Look around you and recognize your part of God's large mission for the world right here. Like what? How about we just start with your family? I want to minister to the needs of... I want to minister to the needs of the homeless in the greater West Michigan area. I think that's wonderful. but I first have a few questions for you about you providing not just a house, but a home for your family. Are you providing for not only the material, but the spiritual well-being? Are you making disciples in the midst of your own family? And do you know, brothers and sisters, that's not always just parent to child. That's a primary formative environment, agreed? Parents, take time to disciple your children. You should be less concerned about their popularity and far more concerned about them knowing and honoring and serving Christ. Popularity is fleeting. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ can hold your kid every moment of every day for all eternity. 
Not even you can do that. Why would we not spend our greatest time on that endeavor? But at a certain point in time in life, children disciple parents. We become peers and the children interact with their parents and they, they teach us some things about conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Grandparents have a phenomenal impact on their grandchildren. And if nothing else, grandchildren disciple their grandparents and how to love like Christ. We thought we did it with our children. Unconditional love? That seems to be more greatly reflected in the grandparenting role for some reason. <laughs> what about your work where you spend the bulk of your time every day? Do you recognize your part of God's large mission for the world in your vocational callings? Do you look at that as grounds for discipleship, both for yourself and potentially others? I have never said, nor would I ever say, slack off your work in order to share the gospel. You do your work well and with good godly character, chances are great if you wish to take the opportunity to share the gospel outside of your work with that person, you'll be given that opportunity. What about your school? What about your community? What about the church? Okay, okay, pastor, but the church, Calvary Baptist Church, can't go everywhere either. Right! Amen? We can't. Our going everywhere is limited by financial resources, yes or no? Our going everywhere is limited by our unique gift and skill sets given by God within this particular church. Yes? Where do we fit then? And how are we to think about our equipping others to represent the reign of God over there? Who, what, when, where, how? We are not, to answer the how, we are not to be simply transporting American church culture to other cultures around the world. It's not our job. It's not our calling. What is it that we truly want to pass on? whether it be here or over. What is it that we truly want to pass on? Seems to me we want to pass on God's glorious story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation. That we want to pass on the person and work of Jesus Christ, the gospel about Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call to faith and repentance. What is it that we want to pass on? We want you to know the one true, living, triune, creator, redeemer, God, whose story the Bible tells. We want you to be freed from Satan and the bondage of sin. And we want you to be freed to worship the one true living God. So how is this to be lived out within their culture? I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know the particular culture that we're talking about here. What I do know is this, it can be different in method and style than Calvary Baptist Church. That can happen here in West Michigan just as much as it can another place around the world. Around the world, a shifting paradigm that we've talked about here a number of times at Calvary for real global partnership with national believers who can make disciples in their culture better than we are able and with greater stewardship. Please note what I am not saying. I am not saying that all older missionary work was wrong or unnecessary. That is simply unnecessary true. In fact, it is that older missionary work that has led us to these current opportunities to partner with national believers 
who are very well equipped to minister effectively but can still use help in real partnership. Money is a blessing and a curse, and all missionaries who have served in other parts of the world would give a hearty amen to that. A blessing and a curse, how? Well, we think cost of our missionary versus the cost of helping to equip them in their work. Uh, it seems that we can just spend money to give to them in order that they can do it. Okay, what, what's, what's the responsibility of that money? What do you mean? Well, where's the accountability? Well, we're going to give them money. Where's the accountability? Well, we're going to give them money. Right. How is it going to be used precisely? I don't know. We just give them money. For what? Well, we're going to build them a building like this. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. You think they need a building like this? That's what we were thinking. This building doesn't fit, not because of land. It just doesn't fit culturally. So what are we using the money for? We have buildings dotting places in Asia and Africa that cannot be paid for, cannot be maintained, because we built things according to our standards and not thinking or talking with the people of the culture to understand what would be fitting and what is absolutely essential for the purpose of, I don't know, making disciples. And how does it work in that culture? You look about shifting doctrines and shifting allegiances in foreign missions, you will find it regularly shifting allegiances and doctrine if you just follow the trail of the money that supports the ministry. We cannot be a part of that. There has to be real partnership and trust and engagement, accountability. And short-term missions, specialized short-term equippers of all gift sets. When somebody overseas is saying, hey, because short-term missions trips can be taxing on missionaries. And a number of missionaries say amen. But short-term missions, people who are equipped to engage a specific task and to take someone else with them that they can train and show what this looks like in that specific context, meeting a specific need. Location, location, location. I'd like to talk with you a bunch about different places of the world, but I won't this day because my time has come and gone. The church sending our missionaries the missions team, pastoral leadership, deacons as they are involved in the conversation, pointing people in directions, not simply embracing what somebody feels God wants them to do. That's a hard thing, right? And it's an unpopular thing. Everybody in the church should be able to determine just whatever they feel God wants them to do, and the church should get on board and support that. We can't afford to do that because we can't go everywhere and we can't do everything and we have to have, be the best stewards that we can with people and resources to point them in directions where disciple-making is being done very well in partnership with national leaders. We have to make important decisions with all the money that God has given to us. We're unable to support all mission endeavors and all missionaries but we must focus our efforts on these global partnerships where God can enable us to have the greatest impact by sharing His story, equipping His people with supracultural, true for all cultures at all times, biblical principles, while learning from our brothers and sisters around the world as to how these truths are enacted and shared within the context of their particular culture. Every dollar spent, every decision made must flow from our shared mission given by Christ and our shared values described and defined by God's holy word. Why? Finally, because it's commanded, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And because of gratitude? Absolutely. Why? 
for the glory of God and the flourishing of His people. Yes, that is what God's story is all about. Why do this? Because Jesus came and lived. Why make disciples? Because Jesus died. Why make disciples? Because a dead man has been raised to life to never die again. Why make disciples? Because this risen Lord and Savior is the only means and the only mediator through whom any human can be made right with God for all eternity. Why make disciples? Because this Jesus still redeems humanity for the glory of the triune God and for human flourishing. Why make disciples? Because this same Jesus is still the only name on heaven or earth whereby people can and must be saved. Why make disciples? Because Jesus has freed us from the bondage of sin and has set us free to joyously and faithfully surrender to His reign in all things. Why make disciples? Because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus the Christ to save people from their sins. Why make disciples? Because Jesus saves. As He has, so He does. Jesus saves. Therefore, make disciples. Thankful that you received and embraced that calling on your life and set a multi-year example for this church family of what that call lived out looks like, Phil and Kitty. thankful for my brothers and sisters in Christ who have equally received that calling and have equally participated in it in your sphere of influence. Jesus saves. Our Father in heaven, we pray that we would take the call and that we would be passionate disciples of you who make disciples of Jesus Christ. That we figure this thing out for your glory, by your grace, so that there would be many that we would see Jesus save, transform, conform to His image and conduct and character and become fellow worshipers with. Give us wisdom as we make disciples around the world and bless this church family as we delight this morning in the faithful example of McMillan's in your work through their lives in this very area. To your name be all glory. Father, as we move at this time to have some snacks and drink. We thank you for your provision and thank you for all who have participated in providing this under your guidance. May you be honored by what follows, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask Phil and Kitty and family if you would first make your way out to the lobby foyer area and the rest of you uh, for those is the live stream still on yeah for those who are watching the second hour will be streamed as well I wanted you to know that but I also wanted to make mention of this uh, since live stream is still on Remember the suggested social distancing guidelines and everything else that everybody talks about all the time. Just use wisdom, caution. Um, But go out, enjoy your time in fellowship. We'll call you back in when the program for, for Phil and Kitty is to begin.
please remember once again that food and drink that you have out there stays out there, okay? And those of you who are wearing masks, make sure that before you eat or drink, you remove the mask in order to partake. Very good. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Enjoy this time of fellowship.